I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the second session of Lawyers as Leaders. And uh, we're very fortunate to have as our uh, guest speaker today, Professor Neil Katyal. So welcome, very, uh, Professor Katyal. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. A um, couple of logistics before we start. Um, I just want to say the questions we, we received this week in advance were terrific. I, I was really very, very impressed. Um, I'd like to remind everybody to please submit your discussion questions on time, uh, which is important for um, speaker preparation. Um, and we also have the option of submitting questions during the session. Uh, so I hope that you'll do that as well. Uh, if you're participating in the course asynchronously, I want to remind you to watch the full recording. That's a requirement of the course. It's, it's our attendance. And your TAs are required to confirm your attendance either at the live session or the Panopto recording. And both platforms allow them to see who's watched and for how long. So remember to watch one or the other and to stay to the end. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, our TAs for the week, uh, Andrine Leuton and Liz Embrania. Uh, and they did a wonderful job organizing today's session. So. Now let's start. Uh, I have to, again, so delighted that Professor Katyal is joining us. Uh, he's the Paul Saunders Professor at Georgetown Law and has been teaching here for over 20 years. Uh, he's also the former Acting Solicitor General of the United States, and he currently runs one of the largest Supreme Court practices in the world at Hogan Levels. Uh, he has argued more than 40 cases at the court, and he holds the record for the most cases argued by uh, an attorney who's a person of, of color before the court. Um, he's been involved in you know, some of the most important cases of our time, uh, such as his successful defense of the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, his victorious defense of former Attorney General Ashcroft for alleged abuses in the war on terror, his unanimous victory against eight states who sued the nation's leading power plants for contributing to global warming, uh, and his attack on President Trump's travel ban. Uh, his 2017 win in Bristol Myers Squibb versus Superior Court was a landmark victory for personal jurisdiction law, and many of you may have encountered that in civil procedure. Um, as acting Solicitor General, Neil was responsible for representing the federal government of the United States in all uh, appellate matters before the court and the Court of Appeals. Uh, he was also the only head of the Solicitor General's office to argue a case in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit when he argued on the important question of whether certain aspects of the human genome were patentable. Uh, while he was teaching at Georgetown early in his career here, uh, he won Hamdan versus Rumsfeld in the court. Uh, and that's gonna be the focus of much of our discussion today. Uh, and the Supreme Court, as you know, sided with him by a vote of five to three, finding that President Bush's tribunals violated the constitutional separation of powers domestic military law, and international law. Um, and actually, I first met Professor Kadyal very early in his career uh, when we worked together at the Department of Justice during the Clinton administration. Um, he was the National Security Advisor to the Deputy uh, Attorney General Eric Holder. And I have to say, I was just so incredibly impressed uh, by him. He was very young at the time, and his knowledge of the law and his judgment um, and his thoughtfulness were really uh, just, you know, I foreshadowed what the past 20 years has brought forward. I was so incredibly impressed. Uh, he served as Vice President Gore's co-counsel in the Supreme Court election dispute of 2000 uh, and represented the deans of most major private law schools in the landmark affirmative action case, Grutter versus Bollinger. Um, and has won many, many, many honors over the years. Clerk for Judge Calabresi on the Second Circuit, Justice Breyer on the Supreme Court. Uh, major scholar whose work has appeared in virtually every major law review. And two final notes. Um, in addition to appearing on, I think, every major American nightly news program, he's been on the Colbert Report. And he played himself arguing a Supreme Court case against the Solicitor General in an episode of House of Cards. So he's really one of our few faculty members with his own IMDb database. So welcome, Professor Katyal. Thank you so much. So, um, so you know, this is a course in which we, we have a couple of goals. One is 
to give people the opportunity to think about their careers and what they hope to achieve. So, you know, as background for that, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about kind of your background and your experience. So first, did you always want to be a lawyer and what made you decide to become a lawyer? Uh, no, not at all. Um, and I grew up, uh, I was born in Chicago. My parents had immigrated from India just before I was born. And um, they only basically, they said basically there was only one profession, being a medical doctor. And that's all I knew. So if you asked me at the age of three years old, five, 10, 12, what do you want to be? I'd say a doctor. I was programmed like a robot, basically, to say that. Um, and when I was 13, um, my dad lost his job in um, pretty horrible circumstances, discriminatory circumstances. My dad was not the type of person to complain at all about anything, but um, it was really hard. And um, he um, wrote a pro se complaint, uh, basically saying that this company had uh, discriminated against him. And the federal judge, who's still serving, Halderman, uh, in the Northern District of Illinois, read my dad's complaint and thought there was enough there to do something really extraordinary. He appointed a lawyer, um, even though it's a civil case, so that almost never happens, but appointed a lawyer. And, um, and that lawyer worked on my dad's case and, 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 and resolved it for him and got my dad his dignity back. And um, that's when I started to think you know, yes, being a medical doctor is one way to help people, but there are also other ways to help people. This lawyer really did, you know, change. It wasn't any real money. It was just the sense of justice, the sense of righting a wrong that had happened. And so that was in my head. And, um, and what I thought I would do in college, um, I thought I would be a lawyer, an advocate. Um, then I went to law school and fell under the spell of so many of these great law professors and realized that I love teaching and that, um, and I loved writing. And so I thought I would be a law professor and a theoretical law professor, like not one focused on practice in any way. Um, so that's what I thought was gonna happen. And I worked really hard in law school, wrote a lot, uh, published a lot and, um, uh, I clerked on the Supreme Court, as Dean Trainer said, but really with an eye toward just going back and doing theoretical teaching. I went down the teaching market while I was clerking um, and was so honored to get a job at Georgetown. Um, so I take the job at Georgetown and then um, Al Gore's staff called me up, his chief of staff, and said, hey, do you want to go work for the new deputy attorney general? I said, what is the deputy attorney general? That, you know, I didn't know what that was. This was before the age of Rod Rosenstein and like, you know, the deputy attorney general being on Saturday Night Live or Sally Yates, you know, at that point that just sounded like some bureaucrat. Um, but I met the guy or Colder and, um, and I started working there and that's where I was fortunate enough to meet Dean Trainer, and, um, uh, and I really thought I would just do national security work. I didn't think I'd be a litigator um, at all. I had no interest in it. I love the national security stuff. Bill and I actually worked on some cool war power stuff together back then. And um, so I thought that's what would happen and um, uh, that I would go to Georgetown. I'd write these theoretical articles and then, you know, hopefully one day go and do national security work in a, in a future administration. And um, as, as you know from the, the book that you've had to read, uh, the challenge, I got detoured. Um, I basically, you know, after the 9-11 attacks, um, was trying to figure out what I could do to be helpful. And um, ultimately, and we'll tell the story in more detail, settled on a litigation path. And when I won that, then things changed. And then I realized again, what I realized when I was 13 years old, which is the power of the law to right some wrongs, and I love being an advocate. Not you know, and uh, it's it's just such a privilege to to take someone's case uh, and uh, tell that story. And um, you know, I really believe in the adversarial process, and so um, uh, that's uh, that was my path. So, so when you graduated from law school, this wasn't your vision of what your your career arc would look like. No, if you told me I'd argue even one Supreme Court case, let alone 41, um, I'd be like, no, no way, that's not me. Um, but um, it's become me. Um, and 
you know, and, and similarly, like now, and I think we'll talk about this later, but if you told me I was going to like be in public and, you know, in really, you know, attacking a president for being lawless and uh, on TV every night to do that, I would have thought there's no way I would do that. That is not me at all. But yet here I am, um, you know, I feel like some the circumstances have compelled certain choices that I've made. Um, others, I've just been the lucky beneficiary of things. Um, but, uh, but no, I didn't think I would be uh, here. I really thought when I graduated from law school, I'd be writing incredibly theoretical articles um, to try and advance that side of the profession, which is something I still deeply believe in. I think it's really important. I love our faculty for doing, for, for that part of our faculty that does that almost better than anyone else in the country. Um, but uh, I've taken now this other path. That I wouldn't be shocked if in five or 10 years I'm back into a different path um, of being more theoretical. And so, I mean, we're gonna go through a lot of the details on that, but um, so becoming a public voice, you know, I mean, we read the challenge, and so that gives us a sense of kind of how you became a Supreme Court advocate or at the very start. We'll, we'll follow up on that. What made you become a public voice? It's not at all what I naturally want to do. Um, I, I like speaking in court to a limited audience of folks that I can truly understand. And, um, and yet, <clears throat> when Donald Trump won, I um, felt a real need, um, not on the 20th of January, but on the 25th of January when he issued his travel ban. Um, and that's when I said to myself, um, I have to do stuff in public. So basically the day after the, or the, the night of the election, uh, November, I think sixth or seventh, whatever that night was, you know, I was pretty despondent. You know, Trump had done things like campaign on the idea of a Muslim ban. Um, and so I was worried it would become a reality. And the next day after a conversation with my dear friend, Mahmoud Hamid, who runs Kleiner Perkins, the legendary venture capital firm, um, we decided with Bill, your help, to create the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection to stand up for people. And I thought that was the model. That's what we were gonna do. Um, litigate to protect people's rights in an age when um, their rights were being threatened, um, not on a political basis, you know, but I felt like Trump was unique in what he was wanting to do. And um, for, uh, on the 25th of January, I realized the litigation piece is deeply important, no question about it, but there's also a public side, of, a public facing side of this. Um, that has to be done as well. And so I just said I was gonna grow comfortable with it. And I certainly had cases that had some media attention, but it wasn't you know, what I did. And so I worked with actually um, our great graduate, Savannah Guthrie's husband, uh, Mike Feldman, runs a uh, public relations firm. And I said, hey, could you help give me some media training? Tell me how to do this. And he was kind enough with some folks to do that. and. Um, uh, and at first I thought it would be limited to like the few litigation things. And then as Trump did more and more lawless stuff, it became a bigger and bigger thing. Um, and I'm still not comfortable with it in the sense of it's not my preferred medium, but I feel like it's frankly just my duty as a citizen to, to call out um, stuff that I think is just so antithetical to who we are as a shared profession. And again, I don't at all think of this as left versus right. And um, many of the times the people that I uh, am speaking with or writing with are very prominent Republicans. Um, it's just, um, it's, it's more a question of, do you believe in law and do you believe justice is blind? I mean, you know, it's, you're such a powerful advocate. And one of the things that I think is unique about your career is that you speak to such different audiences you know, your early work was kind of classic scholarship. Uh, you're a Supreme Court advocate. Um, you're also a public intellectual. You know, you write both in terms of TV and in terms of the press. Do you communicate differently in those, you know, different arenas? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, when you're writing a law review article, you're writing basically to people who um, 
are steeped in whatever issue you're writing about. Um, you know, otherwise you're writing not really a law review article, you're writing some sort of summary or something like that, a case book or something. But, you know, and I certainly have done that, but it's not, um, uh, the, but the, the law review thing is fun because it's so specialized. It's a little like writing a Supreme Court brief um, in which you're already dealing with an incredibly sophisticated audience and you can just jump right in and get to the hard issue. Um, when you're on TV or writing op-eds in the post or whatever, um, that's a whole different thing. You're trying to explain and particularly hard in this age of so much lying by government officials. Like you just, to clear away the underbrush takes a good chunk of time. Um, and so you're left with very little time, particularly on TV in which, you know, you generally a block is like four or five minutes to actually make the point you want to make as opposed to dispel the points that um, have been made by, um, by government officials or whatever. Um, but it's a privilege to do each of these kinds of things. Um, and I do think they mutually reinforce one another. Um, you know, I, I know later we'll talk about what, what I do to prepare for a Supreme Court argument, but uh, uh, really since my kids were uh, very little, um, I think even in Tom Don, I think I did it with my oldest kid, Rem, who's five then, I'd go to them the night before and I do this today and I say, you know, uh, how should I, what should I do to win this case? And they'll each ask me, what's the case about? Now, mm -hmm. if it's, you know, if it's the Voting Rights Act, that's not that hard to explain to a kid, you know. Um, but if it's, I don't know, an ERISA case, <laughs> it's like, what? Um, but having that skill of trying to explain your complicated case to someone who's not even a lawyer turns out to be really, really important in the Supreme Court because ultimately a lot of it boils down to first principles. And, um, and so uh, I've uh, enjoyed the mutually reinforcing nature of each of these kind of different audiences. That's right. That's fascinating. So we'll, we'll get to the Supreme Court advocacy more in a minute, but first let me jump back because you talked about your time at DOJ and then very briefly uh, about your time on, on Bush versus Gore. Um, one of the students writes, the book uh, mentions in passing that Professor Cadio was involved in Bush versus Gore. I was wondering if he could speak to the election integrity issues we're facing now. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I love Georgetown so much is to study law here where the law is being made and contested um, is just, it's so magnificent. And Bush versus Gore was a really great example of that. I was teaching constitutional law one at the time and um, Gore had asked me to be part of his legal team uh, the day after the election and to help on the federal Supreme Court litigation side in DC. And so I got 12 students together and, um, and we worked on it for 36 days and nights. And, you know, obviously a lot was attorney client and I couldn't talk about it in the con law class, but a lot of it wasn't and we could. And Peter Rubin was also involved. And so we were, you know, he was teaching a different section of constitutional law and um, we were just, I mean, we saw, I think even once we brought our students together and filled um, the moot courtroom and it was just, it was an extraordinary time. Um, and, uh, and yet at the end of those 36 days, obviously a very saddening time as well, um, in which, you know, I think uh, a bunch of us felt like the court had acted without um, fidelity to the principles that they had espoused before. So I actually didn't even walk into the Supreme Court for the next three years, even mm -hmm. though um, I had dear friends there who were working there or whatever, but I was so upset, I was so angry. Um, and only when Guantanamo, when it became clear that litigation was the only option, did I really think about trying to do anything in the courts again. I was just so demoralized uh, after that. Um, so with respect to the election issue today, as we fast forward, yeah, I think that these are really serious issues. Um, I think that <clears throat> a lot of President Trump's appointees, particularly to the circuit courts, are extraordinarily good and smart. And yeah, they're more conservative than I am, but they're really good. Um, but there are some uh, appointees who are so willful and political, and that really scares me. 
um, because there are any number of issues and particularly in this unique election in which there's so much voting by mail because of coronavirus. Um, I think that um, there's a lot of opportunities for mischief and, um, and I am worried about it. And that's why I think, um, you know, uh, um, trying to get as much early voting done as possible to avoid the crush of ballots uh, at the end uh, of the process is really important. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not someone who thinks the Supreme Court's going to act politically um, and like that the Chief Justice is like, oh, how do I help the Republicans or something like that? I just don't think that's the way the court operates. And the best evidence of that is to think back to 2012 um, and the Affordable Care Act, in which there was a major constitutional challenge. President Obama had spent basically his first four years on the Affordable Care Act and very little else. Um, and it was in danger of being struck down. Had it been struck down just months before the presidential election, I think Obama, you know, there's a good argument Obama would have lost. Um, he would have had no, no real major accomplishment uh, legislatively in his first four years. Um, but you had the chief justice appointed by George W. Bush siding with the Democratic appointees to the court and upholding it. Um, that's what judging is. That to me is what law is. Um, you know, uh, we, we should have the same standards. It doesn't matter who the parties are. And, um, uh, you know, I, I very much hope that that's how uh, the Supreme Court will resolve issues when it gets there. But I am worried about uh, judges um, before it gets there. And I'm worried about the turmoil the country is gonna face. And is there, are you thinking through a strategy at this point? Uh, I'm not, I'm not involved in any of that. Uh, I've got, um, I've got a lot going on. So, um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not involved in that, but I do think that both sides have uh, hired some pretty great legal power, which is good. Good. Um, and one final question. So were you able to get over your disappointment with Bush versus Gore? Well, yes. I mean, you know, because as you all know, the next case that I, I did was uh, Hamdan and won. And so, um, you know, it was a real slog, as you know, from reading the book. But um, I did get over my disappointment. That's not to say that I don't have major disappointments. I mean, um, I argued the travel ban case bill, as you said, and we won it in the, you know, there are three versions of the travel ban, travel ban one, which was struck down pretty fast. Travel ban two struck down pretty fast um, by the Ninth Circuit. The president said he was going to, you know, see you in court at the Supreme Court. We were ready to go. And then two weeks before the oral argument, he flinched and pulled back travel ban two and changed it to change it a bit with travel ban three. And travel ban three was different than travel ban two because it had like Chad in it, which I think the president thought was some guy, um, and uh, in North Korea, because there was an overwhelming immigration problem with North Korea at the time, but it was different. And, um, and that's what Bush's, excuse me, Trump's Solicitor General argued. And, um, uh, and I, I thought we had great answers, but ultimately um, lost that case uh, five to four in the Supreme Court. And um, I'm still not totally over it. I, I did just give a TED talk about all this, which if anyone's interested, just uh, you might want to see. It's it's just like 14 minutes, but it's basically about my disappointment um, in the travel ban and, and what I've done to try and uh, mentally recover. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think the court came out the way that it did in the travel ban case? Well, look, I think it's always hard, as you know better than anyone, um, when you're in a national security case to challenge a president when the president plays the national security card. Um, you know, um, before Guantanamo, there was only one instance, really, it's Youngstown, um, in which the Supreme Court sides with the challenger. So, um, uh, you know, it's really hard. Um, so Gitmo, those happened. Um, and I think because an overwhelming feeling that there was a kind of legal black hole going on there. But apart from that, you know, the tradition is the president wins. I still thought the Muslim ban was so egregious, so against our historical traditions that I always thought we would win. I, I you know, I was shocked when the day, when, when we did, I, I rarely, I think, 
mentally get stuff wrong, but that one I got totally mentally wrong. And, you know, I think one thing that might have been going on, I have no idea, um, I read the opinion, but the opinion to me doesn't explain, you know, that the, the counter arguments were so strong, doesn't, it feels to me like one thing that was going on is this is President Trump's first year in office, signature initiative, are we really going to get involved with, in a crazy fight against the president right now? That's mm -hmm. a little bit how it felt. Um, and there's a little bit of evidence for this, and I talk about this in the TED Talk. So I basically like licked my wounds for six months, did nothing. But then with ICAP, we brought that um, the lawsuit on the census case, the citizenship uh, question being added to the census. Again, something presidents would ordinarily get some deference over, but we brought it all the way up to the Supreme Court and we won five to four. And the Chief Justice, again, writing the opinion, this time saying that basically President Trump's cabinet secretary had lied. Um, and that's basically how we felt about the travel ban litigation too. But I understand that's a tough thing to accuse a president of in his first term, but um, the evidence built up. And then again, this year in the DACA case, the uh, Supreme Court siding against President Trump. And so I think that the evidence is mounting about, um, and again, it's not political, but just the veracity of this administration, their process of how they do things. Um, and I think it's leading to a lot of defeats in court. So, I mean, is there, uh, in the travel ban case, was there an assumption of good faith that the court is not, doesn't, in the census case and, and DACA has moved away from? Exactly. I mean, the government rested on what's called the presumption of regularity. And, um, you know, whatever one thinks of the presumption of regularity in 2017, it's a little hard to call this pro anything regular um, ever since that time. And, um, you know, this is something I wrote a lot about in my scholarship um, in the 2000s. I wrote two, two pieces in the Yale Law Journal about this, about how basically if the president wants to assert deference um, or an agency wants to assert deference, they really have to have established processes in place beforehand that are followed meticulously. Because that, as long as the process is seen as up and up and fair and in, gets input from each side, then the courts can feel more comfortable deferring to it. But if the process is truncated because of political action at the top end, then it's very hard for courts to defer to something because they just can't trust it. Then it just looks like mere politics. So I mean, one of the themes of this course is going to be the difference between rules and norms. Uh, and, you know, I think what you're saying is that the court started with the assumption that there were certain norms of behavior that the administration was going to follow. Uh, and in some of the recent cases, it's no longer accepting that that's going to be the case. Yeah, a little bit. I think it, I wouldn't use the word norms because norms could be an internal type of behavior. And I certainly think that they've broken norms as well. But what I'm saying is that if you have a process in place, like let's just take um, uh, the Solicitor General's office. Here's the way that I would make any decision because um, you're, as the Solicitor General, you're not just responsible for Supreme Court litigation, you're responsible for every appeal in the country. So let's say that there is a AUSA, a, a local prosecutor in San Francisco who loses her motion to suppress evidence. And she's really upset in some ordinary criminal case, it's a drug case. Um, and uh, she wants to appeal. She's got to write a memo to her boss, the US attorney in San Francisco saying, I want to appeal and here's why. The boss reads the memo and she's got to then write a memo to the solicitor general saying, uh, appeal, don't appeal, here are the reasons why. That then goes to the criminal division where a member of the appellate staff writes a memo saying appeal, don't appeal. Um, then that goes to a line attorney, one of the 16 career people at the Justice Department who writes her or his memo saying appeal, don't appeal. Then it goes to the deputy solicitor general who writes a memo saying appeal, don't appeal. And then it goes to the Solicitor General who makes the decision. The best thing about being Solicitor General, you don't have to write a memo. All those other memos are in. But at every stage in that process, each one of those memos is shared with everyone else in the chain. 
and they can respond to it. There's no stove piping, there's no secret information, no solicitor general reaching down to one of these actors to say, hey, I want you to reach this result, that result, or why don't you think about X or Y, none of that. Pure integrity of the process all the way up. And then you can even have a debate, which I often did. I'd invite them all in and, uh, or sometimes over the phone and argue with one another before I made uh, my decision. That to me is the way good government decisions work, which is um, allowing the inputs to, flee, to, to, to flow freely into uh, the decision-making crucible. And then, you know, sure, have a politically accountable actor at the top I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I like that idea that there's accountability, but I want before that all the inputs to be pristine. Um, and I feel like this administration's done it in the reverse and told the agencies, told Barr, told the Justice Department what, they, what result they want. So, I mean, I think that's very powerful. Um, and it, you know, it's really about the importance of honest argument. Um, so, Let's kind of segue from that into advocate, advocacy before the Supreme Court. Um, so before we get into kind of specifics on different cases, and we'll eventually get to Hamdan, um, you know, Justice Ginsburg's passing is, you know, very much on all of our minds and such an inconceivable loss. You know, she was a giant in the history of the court, an, an advocate who changed the, what the Constitution means and she was also really a treasured member of this community. And you know, many of our, many of the people on this Zoom uh, class, you know, heard her speak to the first year class as they entered. So I think we all feel a particular pain uh, at her loss. Um, could you talk a little bit about Justice Ginsburg? And, yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's so painful to me. I think uh, it's been not even nine days yet. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I first met her when I was clerking, but I got to know her better because my office at Georgetown, Marty Ginsburg, her husband, was two doors down. And so, um, uh, who was just the most extraordinary, lovely man and, and a role model for me and, and how I try and live my life. And um, uh, as a justice, I mean, you know, she's one of the few people uh, who uh, are alive, who've been alive in our lifetimes that people two centuries from now are going to know by name. Um, and, uh, you know, I was uh, there as her casket was being brought up uh, to the steps of the Supreme Court and to see that casket under the words on the top of the court, equal justice under law, was an incredibly moving thing because that was her home that's her home I mean that's what she did she took these you know a few thousand words of our constitution don't say that much by themselves but she made them a living reality um, and uh, so yeah I mean it was as an advocate and as a jurist unparalleled um, just amazing um, uh, you know I, I argued in front of her 41 times um, probably most of those 41 times, she asked the very first question at the oral argument. Um, she loved being out of the box um, right away. So I would often in my prep sessions be thinking, what is Justice Ginsburg gonna ask me? Mm -hmm. um, because that was likely to be the first question and set the tone for the rest of the argument. Um, and, uh, you know, it's fair to say I studied her a lot. I, I paid attention to even specific words that she liked to use a lot, and I use them back in my answers to her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, one thing I loved about her, and I know this was talked about earlier in, in the community conversations, is just her willingness to be friends with people who disagree with her. Um, I think that's, again, really important for as we think about what we want to be as citizens. I mean, you can have a strident voice and, you know, Justice Ginsburg certainly did, um, but that doesn't preclude you from really genuinely respecting and treasuring people on the other side. Um, and I feel like we've lost a lot of that and it's hard. I mean, it's hard for me personally. I mean, before Trump, I would say half my friends were conservative and half weren't. And it's hard to maintain those friendships um, when the war, when there's essentially a, a war of ideas going on, a war for truth, a war for you know the soul of the law, 
Um, and so I think, you know, as we reflect on her, um, I hope people reflect on, on that side of her personality too. And, and um, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, we can build some of that into our own lives. When she spoke to uh, uh, our first year class a few years ago, uh, after Justice, he, Justice Scalia had, had passed, she, she spoke about their friendship and I think she said that it's, it's possible to disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. Um, is that, in terms of your own life, is that, do you have any uh, thoughts on how we're able to, how we can do that? Because as you say, it's a, such a contentious time. It really is. And, um, uh, you know, I struggle with it all the time. Um, you know, I'm fortunate because I have tenure at Georgetown, I can say what I believe, <laughs> and I do. Um, and so sometimes that enrages people. I supported Neil Gorsuch, for example, at his confirmation hearing and formally introduced him at that hearing um, to the Senate. And, um, you know, then a lot of people on the left didn't talk to me. And then I wrote a book calling for President Trump's impeachment. And then a lot of people on the right wouldn't talk to me. And some of the people on the left would talk to me again. And, you know, I, I, I guess I just, I really have a plea for everyone to just, you know, ideas are so few and scarce in this day and age. Just treasure them wherever they come from, listen to them, debate them, learn from them, you know, attack them if you want. But, you know, I think what Justice Ginsburg would say is, don't go and just denigrate the person. Um, you know, obviously, if someone's in a position of power and using their um, policies in a way that harms people, call them out on it, of course. And I'm not saying respect someone like that. But particularly for us as lawyers, there's a real difference between the lawyer and the client. And just because a lawyer takes a position that you don't agree with, I don't think, you know, I don't think that's grounds for anything. Um, you know, we should respect that. We want the best advocacy on both sides. I don't want to win a case because the lawyer on the other side isn't good because, you know, invariably that decision's not going to last then because ultimately at some point there will be a good lawyer and it'll be overturned. Mm. So we want the best advocacy. We want that for our court and we want it um, for our country. And so... Um, that's been one of the things that I found really saddening about this. Like, for example, I do a lot of death penalty work and um, invariably I'm, you know, I care a lot about this issue um, and invariably I'm arguing against, you know, different state officials um, who want to put someone to death. One of the most momentous things possible, but I've never once thought of it as personal. Like, I mean, I really do respect their advocacy I want their advocacy. I want them to do a good job. Um, and yet I want to win, obviously. And I want to explain why they're wrong, um, but, but never in a kind of personal attacky way. So then um, I just want to, one of the comments we just got is, Professor, thank you for clarifying that we don't need to disrespect uh, for others' humanity as we debate ideas. So uh, thank you for saying that. Um, do you know uh, Judge uh, Amy Coney Barrett? I do. Um, we've been friends. Um, we were on the same uh, federal appellate rules committee for, I think, uh, four or five years. And uh, if she's confirmed, uh, what do you think that'll mean for the future of the court? Well, um, she's she's a brilliant person. She's a, she's a lovely person. She's also a deeply conservative person. And so... Um, and we've seen this in some of her opinions and, and writings. And so like to me, the issue, at least right now, as we're talking about this on September 27th, is not about her, the nominee, it's about the nomination and the process by which this seat has been rushed to attempt to be filled right before a presidential election. I just think that is so wrong, so corrosive and We've never had something like that. I mean, the closest we've had was when Chief Justice Taney died in 1864 and Abraham Lincoln uh, said, this was 27 days before the election, Abraham Lincoln said, I'm gonna wait and let my successor, if there is a successor or me, if I'm reelected, do the appointment. And that was, you know, Chief Justice Taney dying, um, you know, who effectively started the Civil War because of the Dred Scott case. Um, and you could imagine 
Abraham Lincoln thinking, oh, this is a chance to do something, but he didn't do that. And because that's not the right thing to do. It's not the right thing for the standpoint of the rule of law or the fabric of the court. And um, so I am really worried that, um, that uh, this nomination will um, really damage the court because I don't see how the Democrats, if they win the presidency and the Senate can resist calls to increase the size of the Supreme Court to 13 or 15. And would I think that be, I think that it's be appropriate? An, sorry, go ahead. Would that be appropriate? Well, I think it's inevitable. I mean, I, just descriptively, I'd hate to see it um, in the sense of, I, I, you know, I think the court should, should stay at nine with a real confirmation process. Um, but if the Republicans are not going to have a real confirmation process, I don't see how the Democrats resist um, these calls to increase the size of the court. I mean, of the last 18 justices, 14 have been appointed by Republicans, and now they want to make it 15 of 19 through monkeying with these shenanigan rules to try and rush her through. Um, so I think the right thing is for her to have, you know, for this to wait. And if Trump wins and retains the Senate, then he's got an electoral mandate to do something here, but uh, in January. But uh, in the absence of that, I don't think he does. And, um, you know, and, and so um, I'm really concerned um, because if he does it without the mandate, then at least the Democrats reacting in the way I'm saying, going up to 13 or 15 seats. And then if the Republicans win in 2028, they go up to 21 or 25 seats. And then, you know, in 2032, it'll be 47 seats. And then we're effectively going to have the Supreme Court of Switzerland, which I think has 40 members on it. Mm -hmm. um, and we lose really the majesty of what our court is all about. And right now it is a crown jewel in our democracy. And so I'm really angry about what President Trump has done to the Supreme Court. Okay. Um, let me turn to, and, you know, thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, let me let's let me uh, focus on a number of students wanted to know about your arguing before the court. Uh, so one question, you've argued a number of high profile cases with significant policy consequences. How do you grapple with arguing cases in which winning may result in policies that you may not personally agree with? Yeah, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, in, for the most part, um, the cases I've argued, I've been lucky that I do agree with them. So um, some, I, some I might be neutral on. But I think that as an advocate, my job is to tell the story of my client in the best way I can, whether it's the United States or an individual or a company or whatever. Um, and, and I view the job of the advocate on the other side is to do the same thing. Um, if there's an argument that's not being made well by the other side, I'll voice it, I'll make it. Um, and um, because first of all, the court's gonna at some point make it, you know, I'd rather they may come upon it now in this case, as opposed to later. And I'll try to explain why it's wrong. Um, I do feel like that's my duty as a lawyer to the court, as an officer of the court um, to do that. Um, but um, in general, um, as lawyers, I think um, that, uh, you know, I don't like the idea that we're confused with the sins of our clients, if any. So when I was um, doing the Gitmo stuff, and I think maybe there's a little reference of, to this in the book, um, there were a lot of people who wrote to the dean and said, fire Katyal, you know, he's representing Osama bin Laden's driver, how dare he? And um, I've always felt like that what you do as a lawyer is you represent the client on their legal issues. Now, if you stray outside of that and then start, you know, trying to legitimize them in some other way or something, absolutely, you should be called out for that. You're not acting then as a lawyer, you're acting as their, you know, PR rep or something like that. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're defending the legal position of a client, um, then I, in general, think that's a that's a that's a noble thing to do. Um, and you know, I've certainly had some of the hardest ones. I had a maybe three years ago. I had this case called the the car case, car C A R, the Car Brothers. They had committed the Wichita massacre 
um, just the most set of horrific violent crimes um, and uh, put to death. And I argued that case in the Supreme Court. And um, that was a hard one, personally. I really couldn't read the facts very often because even though I had to, but because of um, how, how sad it made me and, um, and, you know, it is tough. Um, and, uh, you know, right now I'm doing the, um, the George Floyd case, the, the special prosecutor for that, prosecuting the four cops. And I just last week went to argue the case in Minneapolis, the first set of, uh, of motions. And um, uh, to prepare for that argument, I had to really watch incredibly closely the uh, nine minute or so videotape um, and from every different angle, every different body cam. Um, mm -hmm. And that was incredibly hard to do, even though I was on that side of things on trying to help right that injustice and looking at this evidence so that I could understand the case against these four police officers to the best of my ability. But, um, you know, law is a profoundly human thing. And, um, you know, preparing for something like that, um, realizing you're going to be next to those police officers is, is you know, and, uh, and watch what they did is, is, is difficult. Um, you know, I, I can't talk too much about the case because um, it's obviously pending. And, um, but, but just to give you a sense on a human level, it's, it's sometimes some of the stuff is hard. And then, uh, actually, let me just note, we've gotten a lot in the chat about following up on the confirmation process. And if we had time at the end, I'd like to return to that. But um, I think following up on some of the themes that you just talked about, you do a lot of death penalty work. Um, you know, why do you focus on that? And that must be very hard. <coughs> it is hard, excuse me. Oh, <coughs> uh, I had a class in law school taught by Stephen Bright, who sometimes teaches at Georgetown now uh, on the death penalty. And it just um, opened my eyes up to the fact that, um, as he put it in the title of a law journal article, the death penalty, not for the worst crime, but for the worst lawyer. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like um, there's just some really bad lawyering going on. And um, and when the stakes are so high, how could we look at ourselves as a profession in the mirror if we didn't try and advocate for them? And um, and you know, so so that's why I do it. It's it's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Do you have a of all of your cases? Is there one that you're particularly proud of? Um, proud of a lot. I mean, you know, obviously Gitmo, but um, one that uh, you mentioned in the intro, which. I want to focus on a little bit because it's a good illustration of how um, I know that we have so many second and third years in LLM students who are watching and just thinking about career choices. And there's, you know, when I was in law school, I thought, oh, you know, the way to make an impact on the world and social justice is constitutional law or discrimination law. Um, and in this modern age, it's in so many different places. So. I want to tell, tell a story about patent law, of all things. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I was Elena Kagan's deputy in the Solicitor General's office in 2010. And on May 7th, I think, she gets the call that she's going to be nominated to the Supreme Court, which puts me in the position of being acting Solicitor General. She gets a call in the morning, and um, there's an announcement in the, in the White House and by the afternoon, when I came back from the announcement, I had calls from three different cabinet secretaries asking to speak with me about the Myriad Genetics case. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the Myriad Genetics case even was. Well, it turns out it's about whether the human genome can be patented. And in particular, the specific case was about whether BRCA genes one and two um, can be patented. So these are genes which if you have and your body and your female have a, you know, a really high chance of you developing a really aggressive form of breast cancer, 95%-ish, uh, depending on the mutation and the like. Um, this Angelina Jolie later, um, unfortunately, suffered from this um, or, uh, gene mutation and, uh, and became very public about it. But at the time, that wasn't there. But I did know this because my wife is Ashkenazi and she had, uh, so she got tested. 
and um, uh, and she was fortunately okay. Um, but I remember we paid a royalty of about thirty five hundred dollars for that blood test. It's a blood test. It's like fifty cents. But what Myriad Genetics said was that um, that uh, by dis they spent a lot of time in research to discover that gene sequence and to run someone's blood against that sequence and just check are the, the nucleotide pairings the same or different, that's what they were charging the money for. So in any event, you know, this was a really hard issue. We, I had 24 different memos in a process very similar to when I was telling you about, about the Fourth Amendment to AUSA from San Francisco. Every agency taking, you know, different views on this and you know, fortunately, Larry Summers was teaching me about the economics of innovation and so on. And I went to the NIH every Monday night for many months to learn genetics, to try and make the decision as to what to do, because um, it was very hard and involved a huge sector of our economy, but also matters of justice and um, who's going to have access to these tests. And so... Ultimately, I made the decision to seek the invalidation of these patents, not just for these two genes, but for about 20,000 different gene patents that have been issued. So it was a very momentous decision. Um, the biotech industry called for my head, um, and uh, they said we would lose, you know, we couldn't get a vote on the Supreme Court. Um, but fortunately, we won it unanimously, nine to zero. And right now, there's a whole field of genomics and personalized genetic medicine which has sprung up because of that win, because now um, you know, there's two to 3,000 diseases in which you can run these tests for, not just breast cancer. And soon it's gonna be 10,000 and 15,000. And if you had to pay a, a $3,000 royalty or even a $100 royalty for each of those different tests, you wouldn't be able to have a personalized system of genetic, of genetic medicine, but now we will. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a long story, but it's a way of illustrating that in the law, there's all sorts of opportunities to do justice, and they're not always the ones that everyone gravitates towards. I'm not at all saying don't go work on immigration law or voting rights law or, you know, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in the next 45 minutes, but there are all these, these other places too. Um, you know, I have a high schooler right now who's working on artificial intelligence and racial bias there, you know, and just the subtle things that creep into the code. And, um, and so, you know, someone who's really interested in computer programming can do a lot on racial justice without even, you know, practicing law, but to just focus on how those algorithms are developed. And it's very similar to uh, the advice that Justice Ginsburg would give students when we talk about how do you decide where to focus your career? And she said, you know, think about where you're passionate, what you really are interested in, and that's the area to focus on. And you know, that's a great example of how something that's so technical uh, can make a profound difference. So that's, that's terrific and great advice. Um, so let's ex shift to Hamdan now. Uh, and our students read a large part of the book, uh, uh, The Challenge on Hamdan. So uh, student asks on, on Hamdan, what made you decide to join the Hamdan case when those around you were not encouraging you to do so and warning you about the possible negative effects for your career? So that's, you know, Professor Akhil Amar and, and the challenge says many people said, this is only, even if you win, it'll hurt you, it may hurt you more. So why'd you do it? Yeah, um, well, I certainly think it would hurt, and, and, and in many ways it did. It also helped in all sorts of ways, too. But, um, uh, you know, representing Osama bin Laden's driver isn't exactly the client you want to have if your goal is to be the national security advisor at the White House, which was my goal at the time. Um, but um, I did so because of two things. One was that I deeply think that it's important that we all stand up for what we believe. And I know that sounds trite, but I just don't think it actually happens enough. And I had to look at myself in the mirror. And um, I'm a big believer in presidential power, particularly in wartime. And Bill and I worked on a lot of that stuff together um, as lawyers and when I was a young lawyer. Um, but I also believe 
in order to have a strong president, you need to have some limits on it. And I felt like this was just transgressing every limit. And while I could be the, on the one hand, on the other hand, on some issues, like the Patriot Act even, I just couldn't be on this. It was just, it was too much. And so it had crossed my line. And as I said, that's a hard line to cross. I had a high threshold, but um, that was it. That was part of it. And then the other is, you know, this was one of the few things in which I actually didn't feel fungible. Like in a lot of things that I do, um, if I don't do it, someone else will. I mean, what a privilege it is to go and argue the Voting Rights Act case in the Supreme Court, defend the constitutionality of this landmark statute. But the truth is, if I didn't do it, someone else would do it. They would have done a really good job um, and, and so on. Um, this was one which involved national security law, criminal law, constitutional law, and familiarity with intelligence sources and methods. The number of people just who had that training at that time back, you know, because I think 9-11 has really changed things. So now there's a lot of people who have that. But, um, but back then, the, that circle of people was very small. And the circle of people who, was, who were willing to actually do something about it, smaller still. And then the circle of people who were willing to do something about it and who weren't themselves particularly ideological, as opposed to, for example, the Center for Constitutional Rights that had been bringing this litigation, even smaller still. And with a Supreme Court that had seven Republican appointees on it and two Democratic ones, and I don't think politics or the presidential appointments dictates things all the time, but it was known as a quite conservative court. Um, and I felt like the only way to win this was to tell a really centrist story. And so at that point, there were just very few people, you know, who would do it. I mean, I remember when I decided to file the lawsuit with the JAG attorneys that we called around to so many law firms for help and um, we couldn't get anyone to take, help us. Um, and then finally Perkins Coie came along because I had an amazing student at Georgetown, David East, who'd gone to be an associate there. And David went and talked to management and they greenlit it and they helped us. I mean, and we wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. So I'm so proud of that law firm for what they did. Um, and, uh, but it was incredibly hard to just get any resources at the time at all. And so one of the students asks, um, you know, when you're subject to personal attack, you know, how do you handle that? So, you know, it's, it's both in response to Hamdan, but, you know, through controversial cases throughout your career. Yeah, I mean, it's different now than back then. Back then, there wasn't really social media. If there was, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, you would get it, you know, I felt badly for my dean, um, Alex Lenikoff, who got a lot of letters. <laughs> you know, I never wanted to be a problem for him. Um, uh, and, but the one thing I will say is the best revenge against all that stuff, people who do stuff, is to win. Um, and that's, I put it all into that. I'm just like, I'm going to win this thing. And, um, uh, and, and then we'll see what they say. Um, but uh, it was, um, it was hard. Um, it was hard, uh, you know, when the Attorney General Ashcroft basically gave a speech singling me out <laughs> for my work um, in a derogatory way or when a Pentagon official did and particularly hard when that Pentagon official went and attacked Perkins Coie. Mm -hmm. um, which was a defense contractor, which represented a lot of defense contractors at the time. So I was really very livid about that. And one of the reasons you heard me say earlier what I said about um, not vilifying the lawyer is because of the, those kinds of behaviors, um, because I think what Perkins Coie did was in the best traditions of our profession. And I was livid that a government mm -hmm. official would go and suggest reprisals against a law firm for helping to defend uh, and challenge this unconstitutional thing. Um, so um, today it's a little different. Um, there are definitely a lot of attacks and they, um, they, they tend to be more explosive in the sense of like they're everywhere at a certain moment in time. 
you know, and then they just retreat to nothing because there's so much else in the news cycle. So it's much more ephemeral. And I try and not be personal about it. Um, you know, even when I'm attacked personally and I'm, you know, like just go on Twitter right now, I'm attacked on the left and the right pretty vigorously <laughs> this morning and yesterday for various things. Um, but, uh, you know, I have a pretty strong moral compass that I try and live by. Um, if I fail on that, then I beat myself up. That's important too, I think, as lawyers to understand we don't always live up to our ideals and and try and um, do a postmortem on what to do differently. Um, and um, but but I try and I try and be as truthful as I can about my views. Um, and that's one of the great joys about being at a place like Georgetown is I can do that and my colleagues you know, and I'm sure I anger some on both sides on any particular issue, but, you know, there is a little bit more of that Justice Ginsburg culture here of being respectful uh, to one another and not just on the surface level, but genuinely like, hey, I want to learn from you. I want to think differently. And, and maybe this is a good segue into one other thing about this. And I know we're talking about Hamdan, but just um, I, I should have mentioned this earlier. So when I was in law school as a third year, my second year summer, I worked for the Solicitor General's office, and um, I worked for a guy named Miguel Estrada, a very prominent, brilliant conservative lawyer. And uh, I asked Miguel at the end of the summer, I said, who should I work for next summer? Because I have some time before my clerkship. And he said one name, John G. Roberts, G for God. And mm -hmm. so I wrote to, to John Roberts, the attorney who was at Hogan and Hartson then, and I said, would you consider me for a summer job. I'd never been in the private sector before. So he says, come down to Washington and interview. So I'm interviewing. And I was such a kind of smug law student at the time. He's like, do you have any questions for me? And I said, yeah, um, you know, I'm really a pretty knee jerk liberal. Why do you want to hire me? And he looked at me and he said, that's why you're here. I want to learn from you. I have a certain way of thinking about the world. But the only way I can be a good advocate is by understanding how others think. Mm -hmm. It was so heartfelt and so genuine. It was one of the more important professional moments of my life because it was at that moment, up until that point, I had been really much more knee jerky. It was at that moment I realized what kind of life would I be leading that way and what kind of advocate or what kind of scholar would I be if I only talked to those people and tried to learn from those people whom I already agreed with. Um, so anyway, sorry to detour it off of, from, from Gitmo, but, um, but I, yeah. I've tried really hard to live that in practice and in my hiring decisions um, when I've been privileged to be on the Georgetown Faculty Appointments Committee and everything, I feel like, and, and even in our friendships, I think like there's so much we can do there no, it's very, again, you know, I've been thinking very much about Justice Ginsburg, but one of the, uh, when she talked about the importance of intellectual argument, she would talk about the way in which her opinion in the United States versus Virginia was much stronger because Justice Scalia sent her the dissent. And she said, it destroyed my weekend because I had to respond to it, but it made it a much better opinion. So it's, you know, very similar to your point about Chief Justice Roberts. Um, so here's another question that uh, uh, several people have asked. When you were arguing Hamdan, were you nervous before I'm, your argument? I'm always nervous. So like, I'm even a little nervous, you know, before getting on this. So um, it's obviously a different gravity when you go up to the court, even more so the first time in a way. Um, uh, and as the book talks about, I actually tried to give the argument away um, when certiorari had been granted. I first called Ken Starr um, and said, would ask him to do it. And he wanted to do it, but his law firm wouldn't let him, I think because of the optics involved of representing Bin Laden's driver. Um, and then I actually called Miguel um, who wanted to do it, but he had just signed an amicus brief on the other side and couldn't get out of it. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I ultimately decided to do it. Um, you know, we'll talk about the prep for it in a moment, but because I prepared so hard, at least I had that in my head as I 
got nervous as I walked into the courtroom and the like that I had really, there was no one in the world who knew this set of issues better than me, not even close. I had spent years preparing for it. Now, that was very different than my second argument, which was about a year and a half later in a case called Inquest versus Oregon, which I did pro bono at, uh, at Georgetown. Um, that I had spent, I'd gone from four years of prep for, for to three months. I had just taken the case over at the Supreme Court stage, um, representing a public sector employee who had been wronged by the state. On that one, I was terrified because I remember I stood up at the Supreme Court well, and, um, and I thought to myself, I was 1-0 and at the Supreme Court. I was undefeated, unlike this great, huge, important case. Why didn't I just quit while I was ahead? What am I doing here? And um, that was a hard argument for me because I was so nervous. Um, since that time, it's gotten easier, um, definitely, but I am still, you know, still nervous. And in fact, every night, before, every, the night before every argument, I ask my kids, you know, how I should win the case in each individually. But I also ask them, what should I do if I get nervous? And they always give me lovely answers from think of a cute pig to take a deep breath to you got this, think about your main theme, whatever. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a very precious thing. So do you have anything that you would share for our future appellate advocates about how they can avoid being nervous? Well, I do think that um, the most important thing, and this is in the TED Talk, is, um, is this idea of understanding advocacy as a conversation and not as a speech. Um, and you've got a little bit of this in the book, too, about Josh Carton, the acting coach, coming to me and holding my hand um, and, uh, and practicing the argument that way. Um, I think if you see it as more of a human endeavor and interaction as opposed to an act of persuasion, um, it is really helpful. Um, you then are more just kind of relating to people over a dinner table than you are like, you know, looking out at them over an audience and trying to move them with your words or something like that. That's not at least appellate advocacy. It might be a bit of jury trial advocacy, but it's, it's not at the appellate stage. Hmm. So, um, so you've argued over 40 cases before the court. Uh, one student asked, how do you prepare to argue? Yeah, so for me, it's a relentlessly moot program, a moot court program. Um, you know, as you know from the challenge, I did 15 moot courts for, uh, for that argument, um, which I don't think anyone I've ever heard of has ever done more than seven or eight on anything, but I did. And, um, and my students staffed them. And, you know, I, I, I'm known as a tough teacher, I ask a lot of Socratic questions, and I think my students really relish the chance to give it back to me. Um, and so I had an endless supply of them uh, and willing to really um, mix it up with me in the Georgetown Supreme Court moot courtroom. Um, now I tend to do fewer um, moots. Um, in George Floyd, I did four, which is a little higher than probably my average. Um, and I just argued uh, in the Ninth Circuit on Thursday, this very complicated big gun control case for the state of Hawaii. And um, in that one, I did five, um, again, because the stakes were really high and because it was really complicated. Um, so, but in general, I tend to do three. And the way I do it um, is I, um, I take the briefs and take notes on them, on my brief um, or briefs and then the other sides and then the amicus briefs. And then I take um, a, I open a file on my computer, which is all of the big issues in the case and all the main points I wanna make about each issue. And that becomes an argument binder, which is usually anywhere from 30 to 50 pages. And from that, I, um, I read it over and edit it a few times, and then I develop a one-page cheat sheet, which I put on top of my binder. And that cheat sheet is just like a few words about every one of those main arguments that I have. And my goal is to never open the binder at an argument, but I will look down at the sheet. 
Um, and it reminds me of things, sometimes page number, sometimes I just may forget in the heat of the moment, a whole point to make. And so it reminds me of that. And then I have a post-it at the top, which is my two main themes. And so that I just, you know, I'm always kind of reminded of them in some way, shape or form. That's new as I think it's in the challenge, I think, um, that uh, for that, my theme was one thing. Um, Justice O'Connor, the year before in the Hamdi case, had said a state of the war is not a blank check for the nation's president. And the idea was that, uh, that there are limits, you know, exactly what I was saying before. You can believe in presidents have a lot of power, but at some point there's a limit, it's not a blank check. So I literally took a blank check and put it on top of my binder um, to remind me of the theme um, and to keep coming back to it. You have the whole, you have a, a set speech that you have in mind that you can depart from or how does that work? Um, you, you can um, and do, and particularly in this coronavirus age, you do. They give you uh, two minutes to basically talk uninterrupted. Um, that's different than before. Um, I'd always write a set speech. Sometimes I'd throw it out. Sometimes I'd use it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. Like, you know, the justices sometimes would interrupt really quickly. So when I was arguing Ashcroft versus Al Kidd, which you had mentioned in the intro, this was um, when I was in the Solicitor General's office, I had to defend, as every Solicitor General does, the actions of predecessor attorneys general. Uh, and Ashcroft was accused of violating 5,000 people's civil liberties in the war on terror, and they wanted personal damages against him, money out of his own pocket. And um, so I had to defend him, and everyone, the newspapers all thought this was going to be a huge war at the court, and it was also the optics of President Obama defending Bush's attorney general. There was all sorts of stuff, and in my moots, we prepared for really the most hostile questions imaginable. And I thought they'd actually come from Justice Ginsburg. We have predicted, we tried to predict, what is she gonna say, how is she gonna say it? So I wrote out as I do normally, you know, a paragraph uh, that I hope to say. Um, normally I never get the full paragraph out, but I wrote it out. Um, I finished my first two sentences, no questions. I'm like, all right, I'll keep going. I give my paragraph, no questions. Like, huh, what do I do now? I'm like, okay, I think I can riff on this for another paragraph. So I go for another paragraph. Still no questions. I look over at a particular justice who um, I think is sympathetic to advocates in this plea, and he just grins back at me, like <laughs> watching me twist in the wind. And so then I say, um, if anyone has any questions, if, and then someone asks me like one question, I think it was just, it was just Ginsburg. And then that's it. I sat down with 23 minutes to go. Oh my gosh. And that was because we were winning. They had all decided that we were right, that you couldn't really go and get money out of cabinet officials pockets personally. Um, they clearly decided that before we walked in. And so reading the room, I sat down with 23 of my 30 minutes to go. <laughs> so that's, that's a great lesson when you're ahead take it. Yeah, usually. I mean, not always. I mean, you know, I still, you know, it's, I think, Bill, you were at the Muslim ban argument. Um, uh, I sat down with a couple of minutes to go because I had a really powerful point that I made and no justices asked me any other questions. Um, I could have gone and hit back on some of the Solicitor General stuff and, and maybe I should have. So, so um, two questions. First of all, there's a podcast you referred to. One student asks, what's the name of the podcast? And there may be a couple. Which podcast did I refer to? Sorry. The yeah, so the question is, uh, you have mentioned, uh, and I can't find it. You mentioned a podcast in your talk. What podcast have you done recently? Uh, there's a bunch. <laughs> so I literally this morning just did John Heilman's podcast, which will come out in a day or so. It'll be about an hour long on the future of the Supreme Court. I think it's called Hell and High Water. Um, and um, let's see, I did the Above the Law podcast uh, two days ago. Um, and 
uh, an NBC podcast. Um, so anyway, so sorry, I, I don't know exactly, but anyone who really wants to do a deep dive and learn what at least I have to say about the Supreme Court, um, the one that'll come out um, from John Heilman in the next day, will have a detailed uh, discussion. Very good. And um, kind of another question about Supreme Court argument. Besides utilizing internal resources to prepare for Supreme Court argument, like moot courts, uh, are there any external sources to use and does it depend on the case? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by external sources, but in different cases, you have different uh, interest groups that will help. Like, so for example, I'm arguing um, in a couple of weeks, in four weeks, the big case, uh, City of Philadelphia versus Fulton in the Supreme Court. Um, so the city of Philadelphia has a foster care program and they have 18 different private agencies that they use to identify foster care parents and uh, screen them and the like. Two of them uh, say because of their religion that they will not allow LGBT parents to be foster parents um, and to help them um, and screen them and the like. And so the city said, if you're going to discriminate against LGBT, you can't be part of our foster care program and you lose, you know, our city dollars for that. And they sued, saying that that violates their constitutional right to freedom of religion, to free exercise. Um, so I'm representing the city in that case um, and saying that the rights of LGBT foster parents and would-be foster parents outweighs or doesn't implicate the religious freedom part of the First Amendment. Uh, so in a case like that, there are all sorts of natural allies. In fact, I've actually, you know, uh, offered uh, the ACLU um, some argument time. Uh, David Cole uh, runs the ACLU. Um, some argument time in order to uh, advance their side of this too, which is that the LGBT um, rights outweigh whatever religious freedom rights that they have. And there are other public interest organizations uh, that are, have filed briefs. I think there's something like 90 amicus briefs filed in the case. So there's a lot of external resources going on. Um, and friend of the court briefs, oftentimes, you know, a lot of them generally are not helpful. They just say the same thing as the main briefs do, but sometimes they can be incredibly valuable when they take a different perspective. So those are external resources that sometimes we really look to in a particular case. It's very helpful. Uh, a couple of questions from students on Hamdan. Uh, in Hamdan, the court ultimately determined that President Bush was not statutorily empowered to establish military commissions that failed to comport with the rule of law. As Congress has stalled for years now, and a greater amount of federal government is conducted via executive order, do you think the court would rule the same way today? I do think the court would rule the same way today on Hamdan. I, I just, I never thought it was a close question. I was surprised that the government got three votes when it did. Um, and indeed, most interestingly, the Hamdan case, this is after the challenge was written, they tried Hamdan in the new military commissions, the much fairer ones, the government sought a sentence of 30 years. Um, he was sentenced to 27 days. Um, and uh, he served his 27 days and then he appealed his sentence and, um, and said it was illegal. And in a decision written by a guy named Brett Kavanaugh, the DC circuit three to zero agreed with Hamdan and wiped his conviction off the books. And um, would Hamdan have been different if he'd been held where he was captured instead of being brought to Guantanamo Bay? It's very possible. Um, you know, uh, I'd always felt, and this is the way I litigated and it's in the book, that Guantanamo was different because it was, for all practical purposes, United States soil. It wasn't a war zone or some place in which there was some other body of law that governed. Um, because we didn't recognize the Cuban government's sovereignty over, or at least, you know, ability to impose any law over this territory. So it was, the United States was the only game in town. That's, of course, why they picked it, why the Office of Legal Counsel, John, you and others selected it. 
Um, but it also created to me that strong legal vulnerability. So when I was in the government, um, within about a year, we had the Bagram case in which, you know, we were the American US government was holding people at Bagram airfield in Afghanistan indefinitely. And I went and argued that case and said, that wasn't something in which the constitution applied um, and won it unanimously in front of, even though it was a very liberal panel, but won it. Um, mm -hmm. And won it because of that simple, simple idea, which is at Bagram airfield, the Afghan government was still in control. We were operating under their permission, but they imposed all sorts of restrictions on what we could and couldn't do at the base. And that's what made it fundamentally different than Gitmo. That's great. Yeah, it's really, it's terrific to have your insights about what it was to litigate the case and, and what its uh, effect is. Uh, one final question on for many students um, on Guantanamo. What do you predict will be the future of Guantanamo Bay Naval Station and the remaining detainees? Well, it's so tempting, and this is what I said back at the time, once you uncork that bottle and you create a legal black, a kind of legal black hole, it's tempting no matter who you are as president to want to do that. I mean, the whole point of our constitution is we put checks and balances in because we can't trust, as Madison said, men to be angels. Um, that's why you have government. That's why you have these rules. Um, and today, you know, you can be the most, you know, wisest woman or man in the world. Um, there'll be a temptation to try and put the people there that you want, you know, that you're afraid of the legal challenge, that you want to try and delay things and hold them indefinitely. So I think it's a very hard problem. Um, and it's particularly hard because once you've kept people there, even if they weren't radical when they started, even if they got the wrong people, it's hard for them not to be radicalized now after so many years. So, um, you know, that's why back then we said it was such a mistake and it would be a mistake that may be indelible. And I think right now we're in a really, unfortunately, horrible position because we've done this. Um, I mean, think about it. We're 20 years, almost 20 years in, um, we are 20 years and uh, close and, uh, and no justice for these people, to the victims. I mean, these military trials have never happened. Um, what, a, what a disgrace. Um, and uh, so, you know, I feel badly for everyone in this. So, and a couple of fi final questions as we're drawing to a close about kind of career questions from our students. Uh, one asks, in all of your years of working in various parts of the legal field, what do you find to be the most rewarding thing that you've done? Well, teaching is, I mean, you know, because, you know, you have the ability to influence a whole bunch of students at once at an early point in their career when they can actually, you know, take, take the advice and do something. Um, you know, mentoring more generally is like, to me, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the mentors I had. And I feel like a really, really deep need to keep doing that and wherever I am um, to try and do that and to push people to get beyond their comfort zone. And so like one thing I will say to you all, as you think about this is like, do stuff that's uncomfortable, do it now because it's really hard to do later. Good example for me, I've never done a trial. I don't know how to do a trial and I wish I had done one back when I was a young lawyer because, you know, like right now we have the George Floyd trial. I'm the appellate lawyer and, you know, I can argue the motions and stuff, but I can't help with the trial. And I'd love to be able to help with that trial um, or anything. I mean, but, but I, because uh, I didn't stretch myself back then, now it's harder for me, almost impossible for me to learn that skill set now. So while you're at this point in your career, I would say, push yourself. If you're afraid of public speaking, if you're afraid of thinking on your feet, that's like the best reason to go and force yourself. Go take an improv class. I think, you know, I took um, uh, Freestyle Love Supreme classes a couple of years ago, which is an improv rap group. Um, and mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, in order to do this, like I felt like I was not comfortable enough with flow and speaking on my feet. So I did that and it was the hardest thing. I mean, I was more nervous for that 
um, than like many Supreme Court arguments, um, going to that class in New York with, you know, Lynn Miranda and people like that um, watching. Um, so it was frightening, but, um, you know, I'm so glad I pushed myself to do it. I wish I'd pushed myself more to do some things at a younger age. Um, and uh, when, when, you know, the cost of failure wasn't as high. So, uh, you know, as we're drawing to close, you know, you've had such a remarkable different career and, you know, this is about learning how to make a difference. And, you know, we're bringing some of our faculty who've made difference, made the world a better place. You know, law, our motto is laws, but the means justice is the end. Um, do you have a closing reflection of advice for our students as they're embarking on their career and struggling with the things that we're all struggling with and the challenges ahead? You know, any, anything that they should keep in mind? Well, I guess, I, I, you know, particularly at this moment when the country is being so torn apart and coronavirus is, you know, ravaging our country and our economy, and there's so many people who are lacking, you know, financially, medically, and the like, um, I think that it's real important that we all do our duty to the community. Um, and as lawyers, we're privileged to be able to do that in all sorts of ways. Um, and it doesn't matter to me where you go. You can go to a law firm, you can go in-house, you can go to public defender's office, prosecutor, on the hill, go clerk, whatever. But you're going to have some time that's your time, that's free time. And any one of those employers should figure out a way to let you go and help and use your law and your legal talents to help represent people. Um, because... I think this country is going to be even more torn apart in the next decade along socioeconomic and race grounds in particular. And um, we as custodians of the law and our values, I think, have to do what we can to try and heal. And that means fighting for people. It means respecting people with whom we disagree, but standing up to them when they, we disagree with them. Well, that's a, that's a great way to close. And uh, you know, I have to say, we're very privileged to have you in this community. You are somebody who, you know, as we've seen today, has really courageously stood up throughout your career for what you believe in. And uh, you know, as our students are reflecting on where they want to go with their lives, this was a great conversation. So you know, thank you for the career you've led. Thank you for your insights. And thank you for this conversation. Thank you so much. And to all of our students, you know, uh, again, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and at this very difficult time, take care and stay well. And we will see you next week. Again, thank you very much, Professor Katyal. Thank you.